East Hampton Town Board, we are live. Great, thank you, LTV. Good morning and welcome to the East Hampton Town Board work session of April 2nd. Carol, if you could please give us, do the roll call. Present. 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 If everyone could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we have a full agenda today. We're starting with the public portion where uh, folks can come up and address the board and, and speak on any topic. And then we, we're going to be having Jeannie Carrozza will do bids. Uh, Jeremy Samuelson and Eddie Schnell will talk about the wireless master plan and the personal wireless update. We've got Diane Patrizio, our Director of Human Services, is going to give a Senior Center Activity Report for Spring 2024. Eric Schantz will be here to discuss the definition of accessory dwelling unit, ADU in the town code. David Lease will lead a discussion on a moorings uh, code change. And from what I understand, we're going to be uh, moving the Litter Action Committee 2023 recap and 2024 plan until next week. So that'll be followed by liaison reports and then resolutions. So Carol, do we have anyone signed up to speak? Okay. So we'll do what we'll do is we'll have a show of hands of who here would like to address the board. So who would like to go first? All right. You guys can decide who comes up first. All right, Vicki. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Vicki Lundin, and I'm a senior. I'm an active daily participant at the present Senior Center on Springs Fireplace Road. The amazing staff at the Senior Center are caring and highly effective. I'm speaking about Michelle, Corinne, Joellen, Christina, our chef Rudy, and the amazing team. For me personally, Social, socialization is so very important. I met so many new friends. I exercise daily, doing floor yoga, chair yoga, qigong, osteoporosis prevention, and healing circle. I attend nutrition classes, tech support, mid-morning movies. The center also offers bridge, mahjong, and other activities, including bingo. Lunch is the best part <laughs> of my day. Instead of me being home alone, looking at four walls, here I am at a center with wonderful people. It's a happy, friendly atmosphere, being served a nutritious meal. We're a diversified community sharing together in a meal. We respect each other, and share happy and sometimes sad moments. I feel very fortunate to be a member of the Senior Center. However, we need a new building. The present building is over 100 years old. Space is limited, and during some exercise classes, we're crammed together that when you're trying to spread your arms, you have to be careful that you're not hitting another person. When doing floor yoga, we can't get all the mats on the floor for everyone to fit. Some people have to sit on the chairs. When exercising and extending my arms up above, looking at the sky, I see some water on the ceiling going, I hope there's not mold up there. Okay. I'm constantly looking around and thinking positive. The floor slants, so when I do side kicks, I have to hold on to make sure I don't fall. We can't even walk in the back on the track because it's cracked. There's moss. In reality, I think you can even condemn the track that it's so poorly um, situated. The track can easily be condemned. So as you can see, we need a new senior center. But it's not only the senior center. Throughout the decades, many members of the community, just like myself, have supported the children and other town initiatives. Now, as seniors, we need your support. We need your support so that we can have a lifestyle that we can live a happy, 
healthy lifestyle. We need this new center. And at this time, I'd like to invite any senior to come down and join us to be a part of the exercise, the nutrition education classes. And you're always welcome. Don't look at the inside. Don't look at the exterior. It's a warm and friendly place. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Who would like to go next? Beautiful. Welcome. Good morning. I am Joan Werbel. I have been attending the East Hampton Senior Center since 2018. The town of East Hampton treats its seniors in a wonderful way, and I am grateful to the town for this service. Recently, we have a new activities director, and she has enhanced our lives with many new groups. There is liter literally something for everyone, from Arjan, Qigong, chair and floor yoga, bridge, film, music, decoupage, and last but not least, knitting and crocheting twice a week, which I have the pleasure of leading. The group has grown to about 12, the knitting group, and I hear comments such as, I feel so relaxed and peaceful when I'm knitting. Also, good friendships have been forged within this group. How wonderful that this activity has this effect on them. We also make and donate knitted items such as scarves, blankets, and hats to Native American children of the Lakota tribe in South Dakota. So far, we have sent out two shipments and we are working on a third. We are also participating in the neighborhood quilt program at the Duck Creek Arts Center and have begun making squares for Community Quilt 2025 to the theme of our environment uh, to be displayed on Earth Day next year. Thank you. Now, um, another senior, Ed Galligan, is unable to be here, but he wanted to have me read something that he wrote. So he says, good morning. I am Edward Galligan speaking before you on paper, as today is my annual geriatric physical elsewhere. You may remember I spoke at the last open meeting when our new senior center was on the agenda. This is an important subject for me. I am an 89-year-old East Hampton senior living over there on Maple Lane since 1972, back of the snowflake, now Bostwick's. I have been an active member of our senior center on Springs Fireplace Road for the past eight years. It was just one of those things. I had driven by the building for years, never gave it a thought. Then when asked to a celebration lunch for members 90 and over, good grief, there were 36 people. I went for the first time and looked around and thought, well, I'm old enough, this is for me. Little did I know how true that would become. For since then, I have had two hip replacements, lived through our COVID-19 years, and have, have had terrific support from the town and the center for in meals, when I couldn't get out for my transportation, to and from medical appointments, to daily lunch at the center for a modest, suggested, but not necessary donation of 250, and for numerous center physical, mental, and social activities that have enhanced my life. Not too long ago, center members were enthused about the new plans the town board worked up for a proposed new senior center. Members were spoken to about what we felt were our needs. Suggestions were listened to. Members spoke to town officials and architects about design and size. Have been very impressed with the board's progress to date. The planning pro process worked. Spirits were high, but it seems now issues are being raised and must wonder where were these questions during the planning stages? No matter, in my experience with our seniors, older people do not like climbing stairs, do not like small elevators, are more mobile on one level, 
for easy access to our programs for bridge, knitting, opera, films, music, current events, exercise serving our senior community. Right now, center members who actually use the services are basically happy with present plans, well thought out for needed services and growth for the proposed new senior center. As well, the population of seniors in town is growing. Those not yet elder in time will be. A new center is to their advantage. Let's have groundbreaking soon. The board well knows of the good done at the center now. The services the excellent staff has on offer, physical activities, social activities, and a pleasant environment. <coughs> there are music and film and opera and knitting, bridge and art groups, a terrific nutritional program, an excellent transportation system. There is a camaraderie of peers, the ease of being older and active, still a major part of East Hampton. All this to be continued, enhanced by a new senior center. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. And Joan, did you knit the vest that you're wearing? Pardon me? Did you knit the vest that you're wearing? No, I did not. <laughs> but <pretty>. thank you. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Okay. Please excuse my attire. I was dressed for the exercise class. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. My name is Annie English. I currently live I, I'm currently from St. Lucia in a small island in the West Indies. However, after COVID, I now live with my daughter, her husband, and my granddaughter. I was so bored. After retire, I was working for the Internal Revenue Service as a management analyst. And after retirement, COVID came, so I decided to move with my family here. After months of being home, I heard about the senior center. I decided to try it. The center is a lovely facility. Everyone here has been excellent. Management team and staff are also very helpful. Diane Patricio, I may not have pronounced the name properly, who is the Human Service Director, and Michelle um, Passi Pasileso, Senior Citizen Program, and her assistant, Corrine. I'm to commend them all the way they received me in the center. It is one of the best because I lived in, uh, I was in Philadelphia and lived in New York. They do not have such a great place. I've extended the invitation to all my friends in Brooklyn and told them anytime they plan to retire and want to come here, they are welcome because the service I get here is superb. I also have to commend the transportation department. They do such a great job. They pick me up on a timely basis and take us back. with cautious, very, very, they do excellent job. And they take us to see, you know, to services that are required when you do not have your own transportation. Being able to attend the exercises, as I told you, was one of the best. I will give you a little secret. I was wearing a size 12. Now I'm now wearing a 10 <laughs> due to this senior opportunity because there wasn't much for me to do here. And again, I will say I'm grateful to be a member here and part of the senior center. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Welcome, Julia. Hi, how are you? Uh, now that I'm so old and I can't drive, I don't come to the meetings. I used to come every week when I was younger. So at 96, I can't make it anymore. But I must say, I'm so happy with the senior center. I've been going there since I moved here. I think. Do you just say your announce your name because Carol needs oh, it for Julia the record? Oh, Julia Kaiser, K A Y S E R. 
Thank you, Julia. Yeah. And and since I moved here and before the pandemic, I used to serve lunch twice a week. And now we can't do that anymore because you've got to be careful. But uh, it's just a wonderful place. And I'm, I'm so glad that I was able to come and use the senior center all these years. And I still use it because we, ha we have terrific transportation. They take us to the doctor. They do everything they can to help us. And the staff is unbelievable. And they're very, they're so nice about it, everything. I don't, I don't know what else to tell you, you know? Because I'll leave this with you. This is the programs that we have. Okay? Beautiful. All right. Thank Keep you, up Julia. The good work. And I just hope we make it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be around for a while more. We want you around, Julia. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to address the board? Sure. Welcome, Woodrin. Hi, good morning. My name is Woodrin Montclair. I've been attending the center for about 15 years off and on, and I wasn't planning on speaking, but I just have something I quickly want to say. Um, the senior center is an oasis of security uh, for senior citizens. When there was Hurricane Sandy, we could go there, charge our phones, have a cup of coffee, and see people. During the pandemic, we could have five meals a week delivered, frozen meals. When it was difficult to go to the stores and we were in lockdown, a lovely person would come every week and deliver five, five meals plus extra food. And um, just last week, I have a new car and bells and whistles and sirens and everything is going off. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And I drive to the center and Isaac's there and he, he just looked and he said, well, you have your back window open. So all the noise that you're hearing from the road is setting off the alarms. All you have to do is close your windows. So it's just a place that you can go and have somebody help for any type of emergency, I feel. Thank you. Thank you, Woodrin. Would anyone else like to address the board? Jason, is there anyone on the line? Yes, we have a caller on the line. Let me unmute now. Hello, caller 8764. You're on the air. Hey, there you are, David. Hi, good morning. This is David Buddha. Uh, I'd like to address uh, briefly uh, one of the topics that's on your work schedule, uh, work session agenda today. Um, your your d director of housing has uh, broached out into the area of trying to change policy and not just implement policy by preparing a 30-page draft of changes in the definitions section and of your town code with respect to the uh, affordable accessory apartments. The town of East Hampton stands alone in having a very long history of developing the uh, notion of, of affordable accessory apartments and the emphasis has always been on affordable and the affordability standards for where we allow for a secondary residence with a kitchen to occur in our single family residential zone. There are a host of limitations and we have, we have adjusted those limitations over time several times and you will probably do so again in the future and I am fine with all of that. I have a problem with the broad notion, the overarching uh, reach of some of the zealots that advocate ADUs, uh, accessory d d dwelling units. It is not, in my opinion, synonymous. It's not a matter of just changing AAA equals ADU. There is a host of um, associated principles and policies that people who overly zealously advocate for ADUs anywhere and everywhere to that you should not be endorsing. I think that your current definition and use of the term affordable accessory apartment is, as even Mr. Chance notes in his first paragraph of his memo, this use of the current term is not problematic. There is no problem. If it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. Why are we not content to use the 
unique term that East Hampton has developed over a long period of time of, of promoting and allowing in limited conditions and limited circumstances affordable accessory apartments. We do not want to be in the forefront of ADUs such as cities as, as Portland, Oregon. We want to bring this use of accessory, af affordable accessory apartments to the forefront and maximize its utilization where it is consistent with and not uh, deleterious to existing single family zoning. I have no problem with the continued development of affordable accessory apartments. I have a problem in trying to spend a lot of time and effort to be like other places that we are not. Let me just add one more thought. The expansion of housing, the allowance of secondary housing in a single family zone will obviously impact schools, school populations. And the history of the AAA program in East Hampton shows that it has primarily been implemented in the Spring School District and in the East Hampton Schools District. And not at all, or if at all, in the Wainscott and Amagansett and to a much lesser extent in Montauk. So what we have to keep in mind before we even consider any expansion of affordable accessory apartments is the fact that our five school districts within the town have a tremendous, tremendous disparity of tax rates. The school tax rate is the most single most important factor that determines the amount of taxes that a property owner pays. Even with the 31% increase last year in the Wayne Scott School District, if we assign their school rate for the sake of indexing them, the value of one, the Amagansett School District has a school rate that's 1.3. This is going by last year's numbers. And the East Hampton School District has a, a school tax rate of 2.2. And Montauk has 2.3. But Springs has 4.6, which means that the Springs School's residents pay 4.6 times the school tax rate that the residents of Wayne Scott do. What I would like you to consider doing is maybe the town board does have a proper role in trying to facilitate and encourage the merger of all of our school districts into one unified school tax base, which then would allow the expansion of affordable accessory apartments without having a deleterious impact on those school districts that can least afford it and that are already overburdened with school taxes. Thank you very much. Jason, is there anyone else on the line? We have no other callers. Um, ladies, just one, one minute. I just wanted to address uh, your comments today and, and how important they are uh, for us to hear and for the community to hear. I've seen a lot of very derogatory name calling type letters for the new proposed senior center in the papers. I've received emails that have a derogatory name for it. And I just want those folks to see you and hear you and know that they're not disparaging us you're sitting here on the board. They're disparaging our neighbors who are you. And I want you to know for a facility that will have the services that we provide now in, an, in a space that is suited for it. And also, and I think folks forget this, houses an entire town department, an essential town department when you listen to what folks are saying today in one of its wings. I, I see nothing, no reason not to support the senior center and it is important that you came and spoke today, and I want to thank you so much, because you show us the reality of what, what we're doing, and you help us define what we're doing, and we know it's the right thing. So I just wanted to make sure, because I know it's difficult for some of you to get here, to really thank you for your comments today and let you know that they're really, really well heard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to bids with Jeannie Carroza. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Jeannie. Okay. Jeannie, do you want to just straighten out the podium a little bit? <laughs> How's that? Good. Thank you. Okay. 
All right. Um, first bid to accept is the <coughs> mobile food concessions for select town beaches, um, ditch plains, westerly parking lot south, Walter Zanell, otherwise known as Sweeney's Weenies, um, is the parent high bidder for this. $12,000 for the 2024 season, $13,359 for the 2025 season, and $15,000 for the 2026 season. Mm -hmm. um, next is the accept acceptance of the food service and kitchenware items and also a few miscellaneous foods, Mavilla, Samtel, Apco, and Pueblo Hotel Supply are the apparent low bidders for those. Extension of a contract for the portable toilets, rentals and servicing, outback portable toilets, and then we'll be noticing a combination bid for um, annual cesspool pumping, grease trap cleaning, and then IA O&M for those new sanitary systems as well. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Jeannie. You're welcome. Okay, next up we have Jeremy Samuelson and Eddie Schnell, wireless master plan and personal wireless update. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, members of the board. Thank you for your time. Uh, let's... Down here, you can get a full view. Uh, Did I give them what they need? Yeah, you're up full screen. All right. Great. Good morning, members of the board. Thank you again for your time. We'd like to uh, give you an update about where the town is in our progress towards fully implementing the wireless master plan. Uh, if we can... Yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, I just want to uh, remind ourselves and uh, folks who may be watching about what, why we undertook this work, uh, why it is so critically important. The goal of taking a fresh look at our wireless infrastructure is to put us on a path towards owning, as a community, complete cell coverage throughout the town and local water. So that was as crisp a description of where we want to take our community as we could come up with. That exact language is shared with you today uh, from the master plan itself, which is uh, a, a rather hefty document that I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of bullet points to, uh, to summarize where we are. So in general, how do we get to this uh, complete coverage goal? And you see four bullets there. The first one, well, actually the first three of these are largely in our rearview mirror at this point. In order to achieve this goal of complete coverage, we needed to address the community's need for critical infrastructure. And that even of itself, uh, in and of itself, is sort of a mind shift here. I think we all appreciate that how people thought about and relied upon cellular technology and wireless technology 20 years ago was very different than it is today. The role that it plays in our lives, our need for connectivity, I mean, the, the pandemic alone taught us the extent to which we are reliant upon these technologies, but our infrastructure wasn't matching it. So we had to take sort of a cultural leap and get to a, a place where we were saying, okay, this actually is critical infrastructure. This is not an add-in on top of that. We then needed to take on the step of understanding and mapping both coverage and gaps, which amount in capacity shortfalls. Where are we falling short? Cityscape, who I'll talk more about in a moment, has done all of that hard work. And then we needed to, again, with the leadership and uh, expertise of our uh, partners at Cityscape, design an integrated macro and small cell framework that is specific to our community. So those first three bullets you see on this slide, I would argue, are in the rear view mirror and now we're focused on the fourth slot or the fourth bullet here which is engage partners to actually deliver the solutions that are described in this rather comprehensive document so the key recommendations uh, for how we will get there one earlier please Eddie thank you so the the key recommendations for the plan 
Uh, how do we actually achieve this full coverage? Three very critical, just kind of nuts and bolts pieces of this. You need macro towers. Those are, you know, the, the big towers that you see out there. And based on the mapping and the research that Cityscape did, they said that based on current technology and the mapping that we own, we would need to add 10 macro wireless facility towers at a range of between 100 and 140 feet throughout the town. So think of that as kind of the big, uh, kind of uh, framework upon which a network will be built here. And then the next two bullets are the smaller infill pieces. So in addition to that, uh, those macro towers, you would need to build a minimum of something like 44 uh, smaller cell pieces that sort of uh, expand that network that is started on the, the macro towers. And then you would further, with the third bullet there, expand that by having uh, these bits that you see on top of utility poles and whatnot. When you drive down the stretch to Montauk and you say, Wait, what's that sort of three-panel structure on top of a utility pole? That's the, the third element there where you've got kind of this grain piece. So when you put all of those big pieces together, uh, you begin to see the shape of a framework that will allow us to accomplish that audacious goal of providing complete coverage throughout the town. This is reflective of a moment in time. Technology will continue to emerge and develop. We may find at some point in the future you didn't actually need all 10 of those towers. There was some uh, you know, additional benefit that could be secured through improved design or improved engineering in the future, and we only needed seven, or we only needed eight. These are broad recommendations. They get built out in the uh, the pages of this broader document, but we had to have sort of a baseline, and that's what you see on that slide there. So uh, next slide, please. So this is just a, a quick look back at how we got to where we are now. We began this process in earnest in 2020 with the request for proposals for what, uh, wireless engineering firms that specialize in exactly this kind of work and working with municipalities. Uh, the, there was a wireless committee that was uh, composed of both town residents to make sure that their voices were being heard here. We were sure that business needs were represented in that as well. And then town staff joined them so that there was sort of a cohesive way for feedback and guidance to be provided to uh, the engineering firm that was ultimately selected here. And that was Cityscape. So you see in uh, 2021, they actually, after being hired, began to go out and do all of that mapping work that I was talking about. What do we own? Where is it? What technology is it? Where are the gaps that get created? How do we fill all of that in? And that's really the, the meat of the document that you've got here. They, of course, engaged with the, uh, the community through a survey that, you know, you, I've done a bunch of survey work over the years, and you almost never see something where you've got something like 80 plus percent of people agreeing on anything, right? And in this case, what we found is that 87 percent of people agreed that having not just good, but excellent connectivity was critical to the basic infrastructure needs of our community. So when we do a survey and we see that 87 percent of people are telling us to go in a certain direction, we think that gives us a pretty good mandate to pursue that. And so that really guided the work here. What it signaled to us was that, you know, people's attitudes from two decades ago or three decades ago about potential visual impacts or concerns around, you know, RF or some of those uh, radio frequencies or, you know, some of those pieces, people's uh, opinions have evolved over time and they now weight more heavily their need for basic connectivity as a critical piece of infrastructure. So we felt comfortable moving forward forward uh, with the, this work to build out a complete network. In 2022, the town adopted a new wireless code that, again, was developed in conjunction with Cityscape and with town staff and in consultation with the board and the community. We actually needed that code to update our previous version of code, which came online in 2004. So just think for a moment, if you owned a cell phone in 2004, what it looked like, the kinds of things you could do on it. Our code was designed for that cell phone, not the smartphones that we have now, not the bandwidth needs that we have now. So there was an incongruity of you know the code we own and what was guiding us for placement, how high something could be, what the standards were, what the review standards were. We needed to update that. 
right? And so we did that, and in doing so, also got compliant with federal regulatory standards, which, no surprise, there was a lot of case law, there were a lot of uh, new regulations that were put in place after 2004 when our pri uh, previous code had been adopted up until now. We had to get all of that cleaned up. It was a ton of work, and you know, the credit goes uh, not to me. I sort of came in on the very tail end of this. It was my predecessors uh, in the department who really carried uh, the bulk of that work. Wireless code got a adopted. That was a critical piece that then teed us up to be able to do uh, presentations of the draft master plan to the public. You all as a board had multiple presentations where you were stepped through the recommendations here. You had a chance to ask thoughtful questions, ask for revisions. Uh, we came back to you several times. The public was asked to comment and eventually that culminated in two public hearings. So when we want to take a master planning document like this, as you all know, and ultimately make it part of our comprehensive plan, the master planning document for the community. State law tells us we actually have to have two public hearings on that. So we have stepped ourselves through that process now. We own better code. We own the master plan that says here's the general direction we want to go in. We're sure that that reflects the needs and desires of the community, including the business community. And so we put all of that together and we have the public hearings and we say, okay, we've sort of reached a moment now where we think we're ready to step into the final piece of this, which is making sure uh, that we get uh, all of the back end pieces right. So a significant part of 2023, the part that I inherited uh, when I joined the planning department was to operationalize uh, on a day-to-day uh, -day level, how do we make this work? Somebody walks in the front door with an application and says, I'm a cellular service provider. I would like to provide service to your community. We had a ton of cleanup that needed to happen, taking the new code and making that into forms, information that's represented on websites, creating tracking mechanisms internally, you know, updating all of that procedure, getting ourselves trained. That was a big part of 2023 for us. And now we step forward in front of you and say, okay, we've gone through all of the necessary steps here. We've put it in front of the Suffolk County Planning Commission, so they're okay with it and they've signed off. And now here we are. What do we do next? How do we actually operationalize that? So what we are proposing for you now, bless you, what we're proposing for you now is that uh, you as the town board would actually uh, take a formal vote when you have it scheduled, uh, ideally later in this month, uh, to actually adopt in a formal sense the wireless master plan and that will allow you as I said to fold it into the comprehensive plan and make this part of our broader planning guidance for our community. That's sort of the bookkeeping part of it. Then we've got the real work piece and so there's two components to that and in consultation with uh, the supervisor's office what we would like to talk about with you today is basically over the spring and the summer of this year we'd like to sort of have a two-prong approach to trying to get this really good work in this plan and the updated uh, procedural piece, we want to now make that real for the community so that it results in better cell service, right? That's the actual goal here. And we have two ideas for how to do that. The first one is what we're calling the Open for Business campaign. And so what we would propose to do uh, is draft a letter that could go out under the uh, boards or the supervisor's signature. And it would basically be an invitation to cellular service providers tower companies, so they're sort of a, a third party here that might come in and actually pay to build a tower and then rent the space out to cellular providers. So we would propose to reach out to uh, tower companies as well, as well as uh, attorneys that specialize in helping wireless companies navigate the contracting and approval process here and their permit administrator. So there's sort of a discrete ecosystem out there for cellular service providers, and we want to engage with them. We want to send them a letter, and we want to say, look, we've done the hard work. We've cleaned up our code. We've amended our procedures and we're now open for business. And so we'd like to invite them to review the master plan, be familiar with our code, provide them links for that, and then offer ourselves to uh, sit down, roll out some maps, figure out where the coverage gaps are, make that information available to them, and let them know that we're really extending an invitation for them to come into the community and make uh, appeals for basically your applications for how we could support them in how having an appropriate application be reviewed and approved to expand cellular service in our town. That's sort of the first half. The second half of this is what we're calling our wireless partners program. And what that really does is reach out to local property owners, 
you know, principally commercial property owners, but it could also be quasi-governmental institutions such as schools or fire districts or ambulance companies and say, look, in addition to needing a company to come in and build and operate these things, we also need a place to put it. So that's the, the flip side of the coin here. And so we'll have a separate outreach campaign that basically identifies where some of these locations are that are already described in the master plan itself and actually affirmatively reaches out to folks and say, we'd like to have a conversation with you about whether or not you are an appropriate location that meets the, rec uh, the recommendations and the specs that are spelled out in our code so that you could be uh, part of the solution for the community here. So it's really sort of uh, you know, reaching out to uh, folks who would want to engage as a provider on the one hand, that's the open for business, and then we've got the flip side of that is citing it somewhere and so doing a, a deliberate outreach campaign to those property owners as well. We would propose to do this work over the spring and summer of this year so that we could uh, continue to make steps towards actually improving and building out this network. With all of that said, I don't want to leave either you or the public with the impression that while all of this has been going on, we've been sort of waiting for things to get better. Quite to the contrary, there's been a ton of work that's been going on in the background using the new updated code and the guidance that is included in the wireless master plan to solicit and review and approve a series of uh, new facilities and enhancements to existing facilities so that our network is constantly getting better and better even as we get ready to take this uh, next steps. So what you see here, we've got two slides for you that sort of step you through very specific improvements that have happened around town. In Springs, as you all know, the Camp Blue Bay Tower has been uh, replaced with an updated set of facilities. And you can see uh, that two out of the three, there's really, you know, despite however many commercials you see on TV, there's really sort of three providers out there that provide service to our community. Uh, so of that, you have uh, all three represented in the Camp Blue Bay conversation at this point. AT&T has, uh, actually completed their installation on the Camp Blue Bay Tower as of uh, fall of 2023. Uh, same with T-Mobile, and it used to be T-Mobile Sprint, so if you're a Sprint customer or a former Sprint customer, you're, you're covered under that. Verizon is already permitted through our office, but they're not yet activated. They actually have a lease issue that they're trying to navigate between the owner of the, the tower itself and their spot on the tower and where the equipment goes on the ground. and uh, So sort of bits and pieces, but stay tuned. That one is tracking towards progress so the there. Verizon's on a 60-foot tower, I believe, right, Eddie? Yeah. Still? Yeah. Please. Yeah, they're still on the pre-existing tower. That's a 60-foot uh, stealth monopole. At Camp Blue Bay, just yes. to be clear. So so right now, service for AT&T and T-Mobile is operational. I mean, I can speak to it because all of a sudden a, fl a switch flipped and I you know, could drive in my neighborhood and have service this time of year. But from what I hear from Verizon users, there's it's a very small. Yeah, they've coverage. had what they've had since uh, early 2000s. I think that's the only macro site that was approved under the previous code. Wow, it's 60 so, feet. So I'm going to hand off to Eddie because he's the guy who knows these cold. And so Eddie, I'll run the slides for you if you don't I'm mind. Sure. All right, so we covered Blue Bay, uh, St. Peter's Chapel. They've got their permits. Uh, I haven't driven by there, but. As far as I've heard, they haven't broken ground just yet. Um, in Wainscott, uh, 106 Stephen Hands Path, which is next to the new uh, ball fields, uh, at and is currently still on their cow. Uh, Verizon did complete their installation of a stealth monopole at 110 feet. Um, at and once the town fully owns the Verizon Tower, I believe their lease was already approved for them to move over. Um, so that's just a matter of time. You have an anticipated date, do you think? Not yet. Okay. But uh, they are operational at similar elevations, so there's no decrease in service. It's just two times. Oh, oh so it, when they move from the cow to the... Yeah, they'll fully build the new stuff on the new tower and then take down the cow. Got it. Yeah. Uh, 411 Wainscott Northwest Row, which is next to the gun club. Um, Verizon mm -hmm. installed a new tower there to be able to accommodate four carriers. The old tower could only accommodate three and at lower elevations. Um, so Verizon has been running... Uh, T-Mobile and DISH and at and are all running on that new tower. Uh, so the old tower right now just has the leftover public safety equipment, which I've got to get off there. 
All right, uh, Amagansett the Firehouse, uh, Dish Wireless did co-locate uh, at Amagansett Firehouse, and uh, Verizon completed an upgrade project. Um, in Montauk, Flamingo Avenue, the uh, water tower near the firehouse, uh, Dish Wireless is co-located. Montauk Marine Basin, uh, Verizon did a total replacement of everything there. Um, they had claimed to be 4G, but they were actually using omnidirectional antennas, which is unheard of in cellular. Uh, past 1995 but they were the, still running the height of the montauk marine basin uh that's the tall steel building on their property so i'd say 35 or 40 feet they're right at the peak um that's more of a capacity site than anything because there's so many people at the docks on a summer day um but now that is 5g ultra wideband all the crazy capacity, like a repeater stuff. site it's a full site. It's a full macro site. It's just shorter. We'd call it, City's Keep would call it a base station. Sort of like what's in the chapels. And it's not in, excuse me, down in Skanks or in the First Presbyterian Church. Yes. Or in Wayne Scott at the storage unit. Yep. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's more covers in a small cell, but not as much as a true macro tower. But usually they need those for capacity. Could it be a base for a macro cell? Not, sorry, for small cells? Uh, no, they don't physically tie into each other they logically do so it's the it doesn't have to be a macro site to cover somewhere but then you need a lot more density of the small cell whereas usually what you do is you have a macro site somewhere and you fill in the gaps with small cell or fill in where you have more pockets of density requiring more capacity uh, so they work together as a system but they don't like there's not physically a cable going from the small cell to the macro cell it's not a uh one or the other. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Hither Hills State Park, which is on state lands, the town really has no review or permitting over it. Um, AT&T is installed and operational. Um, Verizon is slated to go on there, but it doesn't appear they've started construction just yet. How tall is that pole? That one's 120 feet. Huh? It's uh, next to the solar farm at their uh, maintenance facility between New Montauk Highway and Old Montauk Highway, right at the Overlook. Pretty much so, the only place you can see it from is the Overlook. That's installed. They did ask the town for comments. Yeah, they uh, did. They did let the town know, which they didn't have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's going to be a good one because every time you drive by there, coming from Montauk heading west, mm -hmm. you'd be on the phone, and once you take that dip past the Overlook, you drop the call, guaranteed. Yep. So you, that should fix that problem. And you said Verizon slated to go be yes. at it at some point. Yeah, Verizon slated to be on the top. Uh, okay. AT&T, it makes sense. They went on first because they could drop in, and then AT Verizon can drop their equipment right on top. Uh, in East Hampton, the 260 Springs Fireplace, which is the dump, um, AT&T completed an upgrade. Uh, Dish, a few weeks ago, started work on their co-location. Um, so that tower will have at t Verizon, and Dish. T-Mobile's still on the old tower at the highway department. Um, they're not sure what they're doing at this point, but uh, that's... Their lease is coming to an end shortly. Uh, 81 Spring Close Highway, which is a Suffolk County water tank uh, kind of behind Town Hall here. Uh, DISH was issued a permit. Uh, I haven't seen any work going on over there, but uh, they might have started groundwork. Yep. Questions? Any questions yep. for Jeremy? Or... Well, we appreciate gentlemen coming in and giving us an update. Uh, Rob, I do have a question for you. Will we be able to have a resolution on for this Thursday to adopt the wireless master plan into the comprehensive plan? That's great news. All right. And then the more work begins. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all thank, for your time. Thank you, thank you. both. Thanks, Ed. Okay. So next up, we have our human services director, Diane Patrizio, to give us a, uh, a senior center activity report. Welcome, Diane. Good morning, Supervisor and Town Board members. My name is Diane Patrizio. I'm the Director of Human Services, and I'm here to give the Senior Center Activities Report for Spring 2024. We're thinking we might do this on a quarterly basis so we can keep everyone updated. So good. Wow. Thanks, okay. Liliana. Um, as you can see, everyone loves to go have lunch <laughs> rather than hear me, which I understand. Okay, I'm going to start with 
We're going to discuss senior nutrition, wellness 60 plus, clubs and activities, and senior transportation trips. I'm going to begin with senior nutrition um, because food is really the most important thing. <laughs> Um, and the mission of the Older Americans Nutrition Program is to reduce hunger and food insecurity, to promote socialization and promote, promote health and well-being, and delay the onset, onset of adverse health conditions. And our congregate meal program provides a main midday meal for town residents 60 plus. The hot meal is served at noon. There's a suggested voluntary anonymous contribution of $2.50. And you can call 631-324-6711 to make a reservation. But it's so much more than food. The Congregate Meal Program provides not only nourishment, but also an opportunity for companionship and community engagement. And pictured is the menu for this month, which is also on the town website and also on Instagram and Facebook now, I believe. And we should say that in the kitchen, cooking up is Rudy DeSanti from Dreesen's. Yeah, he's got a great team of uh, I, I, folks working in very small space, right? Working in very small space with some equipment held together with duct tape, if I <laughs> to be honest. But they. You know, I think the devotion and, uh, you know, the warmth everyone gets from the staff more than makes up for it, but we re really would like a kitchen that is state-of-the-art so we can produce more and even maybe have visiting chefs. You know, you know, there's so many things we can do in the future. Um, right now, Grab and Go is also going on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 11 to 1 p.m. We have Grab and Go. Last week, 65 seniors lined up at the center, and each were provided five frozen meals with all the fixings for a total of 325 meals. You know, that's an enormous task, you know, and while they were being brought these meals uh, inside the center, an additional 50 seniors were socializing and being served a hot meal. So while we are fully staffed, this this came out of the pandemic, the grab and go, and it's a lot. It's a lot more work. It's it's a great program, uh, but let's go to the next page because the other day I walked outside and I saw all the cars lined up and I said, "We need a picture." Um, so. The cars start lining up, and uh, some staff handle the grab and go. So they, you know, you can't have everything packaged beforehand because we can't have everything defrosting. So, you know, the bags are made and they're carried outside. And pictured also is Michelle Pasilico, the senior nutrition supervisor, taking inventory of all the frozen meals. I mean, if on two days you're distributing 300 and 25 meals, that, that's a big undertaking. And it takes a lot of space as well. Our Wellness 60 Plus program, um, what I have pictured is the April 2024 activity calendar, which is also posted on the town website. You can start your mornings by attending chair yoga with Stacy Monday and Friday at 8.30. Wednesday at 8.30 is floor yoga, though you can still attend and sit in a chair if you like. And if you're not a morning person, Friday at 1 o'clock, we have chair yoga for everybody with Lois. Um, there's also yoga at the Montauk Senior Nutrition Program. That's with Michelle on Mondays. Our partnership with Stony Brook Southampton Hospital brings the Healing Circle and Flexibility class with Margaret on Tuesdays. On Mondays, we have Mindfulness Meditation with Lydia. And Thursday, there is Qigong Dance with Margaret. Through our partnership with at Ashwag Hall, and the YMCA, Wednesdays until mid-May, uh, we offer Balance and Self-Defense with Oscar, 
Qigong three dance rhythm and movement with Margaret and osteoporosis prevention and stretching with Lee. And uh, through our partnership with the YMCA, we're now going to offer the osteoporosis prevention and stretching class at the senior center Mondays at two. So that would continue through because we have to take a break at Ashwag Hall in the summer, but we'll start again in September. At the Montauk Nutrition Center, we also offer Wellness 60 Plus classes. As I said, there was yoga with Michelle. They also have mindfulness meditation with Lydia and the healing circle with flexibility and balance with Margaret. On this page, I wanted to show the increased participation for the first quarter of this year. If you look at the numbers, bingo does remain the star. Uh, with yoga, healing circle, and qigong close behind, and the knitting club is also becoming quite popular. Our senior citizen club leader is hard at work adding more clubs and activities. The tech talks will be a continuing series. We all can use that sometimes, and that's really popular. And sometimes you need to be reminded. So. Um, she, I guess, this Friday is cybersecurity. Bingo is every Tuesday and Thursday. And the film club meets twice a month to screen and discuss movies. And I do believe we did have the April one posted on the calendar. Uh, but I didn't post the updated one here. But we'll, we'll fix that on. We've also added American Marjan on Monday and Hong Kong Marjan on Thursday. And I hope no one asked me to explain it because I have no idea. <laughs> and the Bridge Club meets Wednesday at the center. The last Wednesday of the month, we now have a music hour. And that's where seniors bring their 45s and they listen to music, maybe dance, sing. I didn't know if I need to explain what a 45 is to some people. Um, but I, do you know? I have some. I mean, okay, you know. I do. All yeah. right. I, I can remember my blue case with yes. the top. Yeah. And you had so, the little adapter. plastic circles that you yeah, put in the middle. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that's really popular. And uh, the knitting club meets on Mondays and Fridays, and its membership is growing. Our club leader has started some crafting classes. So they're on Tuesdays twice a month right now. Last month's pro project was decoupaging shells. And this month it's pine cone flowers. And people really enjoyed making something and bringing it home. I also want, want to mention that our transportation program, while it takes people to the center and brings you, know, you to the doctor and other essential services, we're also trying to plan trips. And April 19th, our trip this month is go shopping at Aldi, Five Below, and lunch at Wendy's and Riverhead. And we're hoping to plan more frequent trips in the future. And everyone can stay connected by going to the town website, www.ehamptonny.gov, and sign up for Notify Me, and click on Stay Connected. And if they need assistance, of course, they can call us at 631-329-6939 for any assistance. Thanks. Any questions? Great job, Diane, as always. Thank you it's very getting, much. It's getting easier. So I appreciate it. So can I just go back to uh, Ashwag Hall? So we, Ashwag Hall is a partnership to use a, a non-town owned facility uh, yes. for that. But we, based on the, the use of that facility for the partnership already, not uh, that's why we the town can't use this, the, that facility. So it's almost a lack of space during the summertime. Yeah, there, there were we different. Find more space. Yeah, well, the summer, they are booked. Correct. Right, so we can't use it in the summer. We were also trying to reach some people in the community who sure. won't come to our senior center, and there are people who... My mother, my mother yeah. has gone there, but but it's, it's all, but it would would you be, would there be, is there a need if there is a facility during the summer? Um, 
I don't know. Yeah, I guess we could continue it if there was some place else. Issues in the summer with some of our programs. I mean, now we're offering more programs, but, right? But before that, before we really rolled out Wellness Sixty Plus in the summer, you turn people away because there wasn't enough room for yoga with for yoga. Jackie. And, yeah, Jackie's class was very popular in the morning. So, so we did, and yeah, people would hear free yoga and. You know, you still have to be 60 and over to take our class. Diana, but, are there any areas where we're not covering that you're seeing demand growing for like services from human services, just with our senior population? Any kind of services that we can't currently offer that, you know, we've been asked for or we think would be beneficial to our senior community? I think if, if we hear there's a need, we try to work on implementing that, you know, helping me today is Liliana Rodriguez, our, our case manager. And, you know, a lot of what we do also is referring. So we might not provide, you know, we might not be able to provide the transportation to uh, chemotherapy, but then we contact Fighting Chance, who we partner with. Or if someone needs some immigration advice, you know, Liliana uh, handles that by contacting someone else. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to meet the need. I mean, I would tell anyone if they have any unmet needs to call us. And if we can't meet it, we'll try to figure out how we can better serve the community. Diane, in a future presentation, I'd love to find out more about what all the, the human services department does across both in at the senior center and across the entire community. Well, yeah, I do. I do appreciate that because while, when I sit here, I know there's so many more people, you know, if there wasn't someone ordering the food and paying the bills and it, you know, there, there's a lot that goes on the residential repair program, the case management, mental health. Sure. I'd love to know more. I mean, we always we're hearing always mostly about you know the planning department's doing this and this is doing this, but I I just have a small idea of what you do in total, and I I'd love to know more. All right, I you know now that I'm not shaking while I'm speaking, I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Liliana. Okay, so now next up is our housing director, Eric Shantz, to talk about accessory dwelling units in the town code. Hi, Eric Shantz, Welcome Director of Housing. Um, I didn't send a PowerPoint presentation around for this because it's a relatively straightforward and, and simple matter, I believe. But I, I did want to um, put up something on the screen that is uh, two definitions from the town code. Um, so just give me a couple of seconds here to sure. set that up. If I can get my flash drive to plug and play. Hopefully that worked. There we go. Let me just scroll down a little. So you have that entirely in the screen. Okay. So uh, really the only problem here or the only matter um, to discuss is we realized in our town code, um, there is a definition of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, however, that is not what is commonly known as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, what you see right here are the definitions in the code of an affordable accessory apartment, which is what our code right now, that's the term that's used for what most people commonly think of as an accessory dwelling unit. And as you can see, that description is, is um, very apt and, and fits that. It's an apartment that's established as an affordable housing unit in conjunction and accessory to a single family residence on a property. So when everybody, you know, we've been talking a lot recently about accessory dwelling units, the town um, working with CD Long Island has a grant program called the Plus 180U program to encourage the construction of more of them. Most people in the town, when they think of, of an accessory dwelling unit, they think of what right now in the code is an uh, affordable accessory apartment. That's not really a problem. Affordable accessory apartment does describe that use. The problem really is that accessory dwelling unit 
is a defined use in the town code, and it's a use that has nothing to do with an affordable housing unit that's accessory to a residence. It is, in fact, a residence that is built as accessory to a special historic landmark. Um, that's a section of code that was enacted a number of years ago. Without going into all the details of it, the idea is there's a, a set number, I believe there's 15 historic homes throughout the town where in order to um, discourage the owner from knocking down the historic home in order to build a residence that they want to live in um, on the property, those properties were given the special exemption and allowed to build a second single family residence um, in order to facilitate protecting that special historic landmark. So obviously that's a completely different topic than an accessory dwelling unit as we've been talking about them as most people in the town understand what they are. Um, so in order to change those definitions um, or make the, the official definition fit what most people are thinking about when they are looking into building an accessory dwelling unit, we basically need to um, swap the terms um, what I did, um, what is posted online and what I sent to the town board is a brief memo explaining this and then a list of all the code changes. There are almost 30 pages. Again, though, what we're doing here, there's nothing substantive. There's nothing that's changing a policy decision or, or the, the policy that's in effect. It doesn't change any regulations or restrictions. The town board went through that exercise uh, fairly recently last year of, you know, updating the um, regulations that pertain to what we know as accessory dwelling units, but what are right now affordable accessory apartments. Um, we're not proposing any further changes uh, along those lines. This is just correcting um, what the term is. And, you know, it's less to um, conform our definition of an accessory dwelling unit with what any other municipality has done, although I think it does make sense to do that in the sense of if you have a term out there that's commonly used, you, you should coordinate them. It's more so that um, when somebody in, in the town who's looking to build an accessory dwelling unit, we want to see more of them, when they open up the code and they say, okay, let me look and see what the provisions are related to an accessory dwelling unit, and then they look up this definition, they go, what is that? That's not what I'm looking to do. So, um, you know, this board um, and certainly my department is committed to um, seeing that more ADUs are created throughout town. A big part of that is making the code readable. Um, I think almost, you know, everybody in this room knows that the code is already hard enough to read. Um, so I think if you're, you know, step one, if you're looking to build one of these is to look and not be confused by what the code calls this use. So um, again, you know, there's nothing real. We're not changing any of the regulations here. We're just changing it so that uh, the use that almost everybody associates or, or would call an accessory, accessory dwelling unit is called that in the town code. Um, and then also, in case you're curious, it does involve changing many sections of the town code. Um, this is a list of them, um, although that is in the documentation that I provided to you. So there's a lot of code sections that are being affected by this. But again, um, we're not changing any of the regulations in any of these sections. We're just swapping terms. So um, we, we will have, um, you know, provided the board is okay with this change, uh, we will have a resolution for you soon. We'll go through the process that requires a, a public hearing as a, as a code change. Um, it is a type two action under secret, so you don't need any further environmental review. And we recommend you um, discuss it and just get the process moving because um, I don't want to uh, continue the confusion uh, that exists in the town code, at least for this uh, particular use and, and situation. And then you're changing the name for the accessory single family residence that's on the same property as historic landmark. Yeah, I, you know, um, Brevity is not on the side of this, but I'm uh, proposing to call it sing, uh, single family residence as accessory to a special historic landmark. That's what it is. Um, again, I think there's only 15 properties throughout town that are even eligible for this. It's not something that comes up too often. So, um, you know, even though people are going to be wasting syllables and breath saying it, uh, it doesn't come up too often. So. I think one of the, the benefits of doing this, and you've, you've called this out, is just nomenclature here that, you know, there are grants available for people, such as the Plus One ADU program. As people look to research how to undertake these things and look for grant money, having the same name is critical to kind of help them engage those grant systems. So I think it's a good, good idea. I agree with Tom. Um, I think it's important to have terms that are common usage for 2024. 
Yeah, I, I agree as well. And, and somebody, you know, a caller earlier spoke to this issue. And, and just to be clear, um, we asked Eric to do this. You know, there was confusion over these terms. And so, you know, I asked Eric to, to work on this. And there's no substantive change here. It's just as Tom and, and Kate and everybody and, and Eric has said, to make sure that our terms are consistent with generally used terms. I think separately, the town may take initiatives to encourage ADUs, but that's a, a totally separate conversation. This truly is just clarifying terminology. And even though um, one of those terms is not super brief, I think there's some beauty and accuracy and yeah. mm -hmm. it's, it is an accurate name um, for you. You can come up with a different name and we'll substitute it in the legislation. And I just figured that was descriptive and, you know, no. so th thank, thank you, Eric. Cause I know it was, it's a, it's a lot of pages because these, these terms appeared so many different places, but um, just so the public knows it's not actually 30 pages of overhaul. It's just replacing terms. And I think I got all of them. Yeah, that, <laughs> that work in itself, Eric, I applaud you for going through the code and finding every reference for it. Thank you. So this is going to take some time, I right, for the for the attorney's office to put this in minute track. This isn't something that's going to be on this week. They're or, they've already been working on it. Um, uh, I think it might be on for Thursday, okay. but I don't want to commit them to it. You know, we'll um, uh, obviously it's not something that is uh, immediately pressing or there's some kind of, you know, deadline that you're looking to meet with something, you know, related to this definition. But we'll try to expedite it and get it back in front of you with a resolution with the full list um, of all the code sections in that standard format um, as soon as we can. I, I think the other piece there as well is perhaps a timeline for our website update. Yeah. I know when you kind of search there, it doesn't really come up. So all that kind of cloud should be changed too. For sure. Okay. And then this would require a public hearing because yep. it's changing. So. Now, does this, because you're changing the zoning code, does this have to go to uh, the planning board? That's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Um, Commission too. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we'll we'll take care of those. We'll take care of all the you know procedural requirements. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Thank you. Eric. Appreciate it. Okay, next up we have the uh, code change for moorings. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. I'm uh, joined here with Harbor Master Jay Sharon and also from the Town Attorney's Office, Nick Corsitas. Um, uh, this is uh, the town has moorings and we have jurisdictional waters in which our moorings are in, and this primarily for Lake Montauk. Uh, the moorings, jurisdictional uh, waters for other areas are primarily under the town trustees, so this will not affect them. Uh, this came to us most recently, a couple of years ago, in discussions with uh, our, our town clerk, Carol Brennan, also their senior harbor master, uh, Ed Michaels at that time, and now rolled into uh, senior harbor master. Tim Treadwell. Uh, to be very, just to give you a little bit of background, gentlemen, you can come to the podium if you like, both of you. Um, town has moorings, and a mooring primarily states it's a type of uh, instrument that actually fixes a boat to the bottom waters. Uh, within the town code, and use of trends of these uh, moorings right now, we are trying to catch up to modern day use of modern day trends. So we're looking to actually give four definitions to our town moorings now and how they might be used. One of them would be a non-transferable mooring. That's a mooring that's issued for a permit holder, exclusive use for the special mooring location, a special uh, vessel registration uh, listed on the permit. Such permit shall not, uh, shall not be valid for any other location, person, or vessel, such as a vessel registration uh, re always matches the permit holder. And next would be a commercial business entity mooring. This would be a mooring that shall be, uh, not be used for commercial fishing, but may be used by other commercial entities, such as a private yacht club, for transient use subject to the provisions of the chapter. This then brings in what a commercial fishing mooring is. It's a non-transferable mooring that is exclusively used for commercial fishing purposes subject to the provisions in the chapter. And again, uh, the resident in the last one, fourth one, would be a residential recreational mooring which is a non-transferable mooring exclusive to resident permit holders used for the sole purpose of, rec uh, of recreation. Uh, within the working group, we thought that these, uh, uh, these definitions and then through Nick's research would be most, uh, uh, give most clarity for uses, trends, and also for adjudication if anyone is not using the, uh, using the mooring uh, as described. Also, what we're doing is trying to describe what a mooring is. Mm -hmm. And surprising to me, didn't really know what uh, uh, 
there's there's uh, there's gray area here. There's new technologies, and we're trying to catch up to those new technologies. A mooring now would be defined as all types of ground tackle, including anchors that are designed to keep a vessel in an approximate position for the duration of time greater than two weeks. Uh, just gives a little bit more strength to that those definitions. <laughs> Lastly, uh, with those, we would like to look at our fee schedule. Uh, uh, the fee schedule, we would like to increase the commercial business entity moorings up to $500 per mooring. Uh, the residential and recreational uh, will stay at $50 per mooring. The non-residents will go to $30 per, per foot of boat length, and the commercial fisherman mooring fee is waived for the first one. The second mooring is $10 on there. Uh, so that's coming out of recommendation from that working group. Um, uh, Jay, do you want to give some just more context about what you might be seeing out there as far as the mooring fields and how this language might assist you uh, in compliance. Just yeah, one so, second, David. Can uh, I, before you start, can I just I want to add, just sure. clarify, David? When you say if five hundred per mooring, is that a season? That is correct. This is all per season. Okay. So all all of moorings are are per season. Sorry, to interrupt. Okay. So uh, yeah, the definition change um, that just is a way to assist us with enforcement. Um, then uh, the uh, the commercial entity mooring. There's some uh, of the uh, yacht clubs in Montauk that are using their bottom land that have transient mooring. So this is just to help uh, accommodate that. Um, That's pretty much it. It's it's not a major change. It's just clarity into the language of the code. Uh, Nick, do you want to give us some context about uh, your research also? Uh, certainly. Well, just... To sort of circle back, I think you this is Nick Cordesitas. For anyone who doesn't know Nick, I am Nick Cordesitas. Town Attorney's I'm Office. I'm with the Town Attorney's Office. Um, yeah, I think I think you both did a good job, and working with uh, Senior Harbor Master Treadwell, uh, I think I think we are definitely encapsulating all these little gray areas that we are worried about, especially on the enforcement side. So, if you're comfortable that this meets what you're actually uh, experiencing on the ground, then I, I think or on the water. On the, very good. Well, or, well the mooring on the bottom land. The water. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I feel comfortable that if this all works, we're in, we're in good shape. I, one, one question I have here is just that obviously we're seeing kind of more and more commercial activities on the water. Um, do we have a cap on the number of moorings that we're willing to kind of allow in those water bodies? Um, or is that something you think is necessary at this time? Well, it, 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 the space kind of puts that limit on there because the, the boats have to have a certain amount of scope of line to, to swing. So, uh, you know, it's really dependent on the space that's available. And also depth, you know, water depth in those locations then too. Uh, no mooring field will be allowed without, uh, no mooring, no mooring field would be allowed without uh, the harbor master being, looking at the bottom lands and for safety navigational waterways and such also then too. But it's mostly not looking to cap it. It's mostly looking just to define the trends and uses right now that we're seeing. And also may I ask uh, what, is the the importance of the duration of time greater than two weeks? What is how does that how does that uh, play out? Well, so, so uh, you know, currently, if a, if a boat is at anchor, um, the only thing we have is that the that cannot be left unoccupied for more than twelve hours. So, what we find is we have a, a lot of people come in, stay on anchor for you know prolonged periods, and they're saying. Oh no! I move it. I'm moving it. You know, so the two week limit just um, you know it helps us to enforce it. Yeah, I was looking for you know why wouldn't it be one week? <laughs> you know, even even more strict. But I understand what you're saying. Exactly. And when and when uh, boaters are coming to our jurisdictional waters, we want to make sure that they're doing the same. The same. Uh, we already checked the Y valves on them for pump out. We have the uh, pump out stations also. So again, this is just modernizing our code to. What we're seeing, what we're using, um, any type of changes if the board wants to move forward in the definitions in 246-2. Uh, further, we would actually and uh, we would have to go to a public hearing on, uh, and then as far as the fee schedule changes, they can be done by by a resolution. So that's something that's brought to us. I don't know, Carol. Do you have any comments? Are you comfortable with the language? Mm -hmm. so, so, but the, the the permit in the section F is permits are only in effect April 1st to December 1st. Mm -hmm. 
does that want to be reflected on the application? I mean, to Kate's point, it, it might be clear, clearer if you carried that over. And I was just looking in here, where in the legislation does it say that it's um, the fee is set from time to time by board resolution? I may have missed it, but I didn't see it um, in the legislation. That's a question for Rob. I mean, we'll have to add that in, but I don't think, you know, if you're comfortable with us just adding a provision, then I don't think you'd have to come back to the work session. Yeah, no. no. I mean, that's standard language we've been using now to give us the flexibility, not have to, not have to go to public hearing just for a fee change. But I'm good with the recommendation. Yep. Me too. So we're comfortable with that. We'll add that language into it, Rob and Nick, and maybe we can even get this scheduled for notice of public hearing on Thursday so we can hear it at the the next available meeting in April. Uh, knowing that that window is opening, we're getting uh, comments and questions for permitting from Moorings. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for participating, Nick and Jay. Yeah, thanks, Thank Jay. You. Thanks, Nick. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so those are all our topics for today, and we can move on to liaison reports. All righty. Um, Armagansett Advisory Committee, there is a meeting Monday, April 8th, 6.30 p.m. at the Armagansett School Library. Uh, additionally, coming up, um, a meeting with Fred Thiel, April 12th, and others to discuss decaying trees along MY27. Also want to bring attention that there's a blood drive for the community um, on Monday, April 8th. Thank you so much. You can see it on the screen. If you scan the... Um, code on the bottom that will give you all the details there. Uh, it's, as I said, April 8th at the Armagansett Legion Hall. Um, and then additionally on April 4th at 3 p.m., Armagansett School is um, hosting a session to understand what the community needs for a new superintendent um, should possess. Um, moving on, trustees. Um, there was a trustees meeting last week with an excellent presentation by high school student uh, Jocelyn Garcia on the use of shellfish to improve water quality across town bodies. This was followed by a very interesting presentation by Dr. Gobra of Stony Brook University on the health of the water bodies across East Hampton Town and his use of DNA analysis to isolate drivers of pollution, which will help the town and the trustees mitigate action to um, causing pollution. Um, additionally, he was looking at water temperature across the water bodies such as Napi Harbor uh, and the impacts that has. Um, one thing I thought was kind of interesting given what we faced already this year is that he made the comment that the hundred year storms are now seemingly occurring every 10 years, especially in the Northeast. Um, sanitation, um, we'll be talking this a little bit in the resolutions, but there was a fire with our old grinder which um, we'll be looking to replace. Um, ADU implementation, excellent presentation by Eric Chance, our Director of Housing. Um, uh, I, the thing that really covers everything I've got on there. Peconic Estuary, um, I had a meeting with Jason Heim, the uh, Chief of the Office of Water Resources for Suffolk County Department of Health Services. Um, they, they cover public water oversight for the town, um, and we're just getting some interesting feedback from him on what testing takes place across the town for our water quality. Um, Brooks Park, the committee is reviewing the draft licensing agreement from the town attorney, and I will be uh, discussing with the other board members uh, their proposed amendments to said licensing agreement in the near future. Um, East End Fire Commissioners, um, OSHA guidelines, which I've briefly mentioned before, there's some new, um, very, um, let's say strict, but very kind of um, protective guidelines that OSHA is putting out currently, that there are concerns um, just in terms of how much time it will require our fire districts in this area to implement said changes. There's a general consensus that the OSHA guidelines are correct in terms of protective nature. It's just that they will be challenging to implement both at fire level and potentially at our police department level. Um, the there's been an extension of the period for public comment uh, for 45 days. So if anyone does wish to make any comments, that can be done until June 21st. Um, Public safety, um, 
beach access ladders, just kind of a reminder to the public that permits are required for repair. Um, and should you have any questions about your beach access ladders, please do contact our planning and building departments accordingly. Um, from a public safety perspective, I also want to thank PD and all first responders for the help they did with the St. Patrick's Day's Parade, both in Montauk and uh, um, against it. Um, it's also a good reminder from public safety that the tourist season is kind of upon us. You may have seen it this weekend with Easter weekend. Um, changing traffic patterns, um, just you know, be slightly more aware as the traffic um, changes out in the community. Um, also, a reminder that you know, um, residents and visitors do need permits to drive on town beaches. Um, and then finally, a reminder that on April 11th, there is a public safety partnership meeting in Montauk at 2 p.m. at the Montauk Library. Um, Disabilities Advisory Board, we have a meeting Friday 19th. I'm also delighted to announce that Anne Bell is going to be the new ADA coordinator for the town. And I'd like to thank my colleagues at Southampton town for their help in um, identifying training resources for said person. Um, East Hampton Youth Task Force, we met March 21st. We have formed three subcommittees to really focus around the impact of social media. Um, we'll be looking at plans to support parents and adults, young adults and youth. Um, Anti-bias task force um, committees focusing on four key areas there with events, education, and um, publicity and survey. Arts Council, we have a we met March 25th. Um, we have scheduled the first networking night of the year for April 25th at the clubhouse from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, the next Art Council meeting will be held April 22nd at 5 p.m. in the Town Hall. Um, Business Advisory Committee will be meeting April 17th at 2 p.m. via Zoom. Um, and finally, Emergency Preparedness Committee Chairs have been appointed. They are John D'Agostino and Vinnie Franzone, uh, and subcommittees have also been formed. Our next meeting is this Friday at 1 p.m. Thank you. An update on the Fire Island, the Montauk project. Uh, we are in the final stages of that project, which would include uh, um, matting, vehicular matting, and actually pedestrian access matting and fence lines. I want to thank uh, the supervisor for her advocation to the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, all the way through Senator Schumer's office of Mike Alianelli to assist with uh, design of and placement of pedestrian access ways and then also for the grasses. So thank you to the supervisor for doing so. Um, the Montauk CAC met last night. It was uh, a good meeting. Uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, they, uh, two of the things I know that we had on today initially, which was to be for the spring fling, uh, no spring fling. Uh, they made a motion to, uh, uh, they're going to adopt, uh, the Montauk CAC is going to adopt the street for ditch planes down to DeForest Road, and also made a motion to have a uh, no spring uh, fling uh, litter pickup day for May 11th. Uh, there's two other ones happening in Montauk in the successful weekends in advance of that, one being held by Gurney's, one also being held by CCOM. So if you're interested in uh, assisting uh, picking up litter on the roads, uh, 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 in the end of April or in the right of ways, please contact CCOM Gurney's, or you can also come to my office or council member Kate Rogers' office. Um, I want to let everyone know that we're making progress to move forward with our paid parking initiatives in Montauk. We discussed this about two years ago. The locations are uh, are in some of the right-of-ways on Edgemere and also on Edison. And two, we're going to move forward. We have our uh, license plate readers. This is discussed at the Montauk CAC a couple of years back, and it's taken us some time just to move forward through the matriculations of procurement of our payment processes. We're going to be looking to use Park Mobile moving forward and hopefully get this set for this impending summer season right now. This also means that we'll be using paid parking at our paid parking lot through an app for uh, Kirk Park this year. In all these locations, if you have an East Hampton Town permit, you'll be allowed to park there also. But now we're putting together the enforcement aspects and then also uh, uh, um, the background information as far as collecting payment. I'll bring more information to the board as far as the locations and to the general outreach as we move ahead. Uh, but we're going to move forward with, pay, uh, with uh, Park Mobile. What's also good about that, it is very similar to what other jurisdictions are using from Sag Harbor, West, even East Hampton Village. So for the convenience of of the residents and users, they won't have to have multiple uh, parking apps also. So I thought that was actually because uh, it's good synergy. I want to let everyone know major uh, projects are about to start in construction in Montauk. 
these projects are going to be the Montauk Playhouse, in which they're going to be starting the construction next Monday. Uh, there will be changes to the parking uh, in that area, uh, the parking lot, and we, uh, we are outreaching to all the entities that use the Montauk Playhouse. Also did that to the Montauk CAC last night. Um, second house restoration will be starting in, uh, imminently also. That will be about an eight-month restoration of the interior phase three, and that will be starting also very shortly. Uh, lastly, we'll be starting the South Beach uh, restoration on Lake Montauk. Uh, this area uh, is for water uh, quality improvements, where we'll be replacing a bathroom with the IA system, permeable pavers, uh, and other uh, bioswales to improve, um, improve water quality. What that all means is that the town board is, is wants to alert everyone, not alarm them, and also uh, looking for patience as these projects move ahead for the betterment and uh, of the community, and also shows the town board's commitment to these facilities of historical preservation, recreation needs, and then also water quality then too. Dump permit is due now, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everyone, uh, the dump permit is due. There's multiple ways to getting a, uh, a dump permit. You can go to the town clerk's office, town clerk's annex office. You can mail your request in also, and you can also go to our recycling center uh, on, St on Springs Fireplace Road. Uh, the Water Quality Technical Advisory Committee met. Uh, uh, Madam Supervisor, we'd like to put that on potentially for next week for mm -hmm. their recommendations uh, for the RFA-1 for calendar year 2024. Uh, I want to thank uh, Sag Harbor Village Trustees Korish and Deputy Mayor Hay, uh, uh, myself and other members of the Water Quality uh, and Town Administrator had a meeting with them to uh, go over what their project is mo moving forward as far as expansion of their of their uh, of their sewer lines into Sewer Shed L, which is actually on uh, within the within town lands, but jurisdiction of the village on there, uh, and they're will, uh, they're open to talk to any town board member moving forward, but they have a good plan and moving ahead. The Beach Advisory Group also met about two weeks ago. Uh, good news there is our health permits are in place for our bathing beaches. Uh, and uh, I would like to come to the town board either end of April or beginning of May. We'll look at the calendar, uh, Madam Supervisor, uh, and, let, uh, and get ready for our upcoming and pending season. One of the things we're going to have to look at is temporary storage of our, our lifeguard quads and uh, and also uh, Marine Patrol quads. We might have to be looking at, for this summer season specifically, a Connex storage location, uh, temporary one of these locations. I'll bring that to the town board. We don't want to leave them outside because of vandalism and also the elements on there then too. That brings me up to recreation. We are always hiring. The town is looking hiring for, uh, for lifeguards for the upcoming summer season. Uh, we are holding our spring lifeguard programs are in full swing right now. Please contact uh, the town uh, uh, recreational department, John Rooney, for this information, or you can go on online. Uh, we're also looking to hire recreational park aides for the summer. The town is also looking to hire laborers and also staffing in our buildings and grounds department. Uh, plenty of great positions in the town of East Hampton. Please contact our human resources department at 631-324-4141. Um, our recreational programs are now available for online registration at the town's website. This will be for the spring youth soccer. Uh, and then also for the spring tennis clinics, please contact, uh, uh, go online to uh, the Newtown's website to the recreational page for more information on how uh, you can sign up for these locations. Uh, lastly, in recreation, uh, the pickleball courts and basketball courts will, in Montauk, which we installed, I thank the board for their support on that. They're actually getting used a lot. Tom, you live right up there. Yeah, my kids use them. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the basketball courts getting used a lot, and even more so, not just the 10-foot rims, but the 8-foot rims are getting used because a lot of kids just can't shoot to a 10-foot rim. I want to thank Howard Wood for talking us through that. Uh, a, a couple of years back, uh, but they're going to use a lot, and we are going to be epoxy coating them. Again, we'll give as much notice as possible as that will be. Those courts will be closed down for days for the need of drying of that. Um, everyone, guess what Saturday is? Great. Opening day. Oh. That, that's why you're the Madam Supervisor. <laughs> it is opening day for Little League. Ah. Okay, Little League opening day. Uh, the teams are playing right now. The volunteer coaches are out there. Umpires are there. It's opening day. Uh, and then teams will be playing. So what that pretty much means is that 
uh, we're continuing, they're continu East Hampton Little League is continuously looking for volunteers for uh, coaching and then also uh, for umpires. Uh, please contact Dave Rakowski or the East Hampton Little League. You contact my office, I can get to them. It also means that kids are out there playing right now. Uh, right. Spring is here. They're out and they're moving around. So be, please be very careful when uh, you're around our facilities and specifically driving around our facilities. Slow down right now then too. But is it always a good thing as the parents start to move and mingle around then too? So are they having an opening day ceremony? Uh, they are having an opening day ceremony and I believe it's at 10 a.m. on the 6th at Stephen Hans Path facilities then too. It's always a fun fun little thing. I, I have a couple of kids playing this year also. I have, a two, I have two girls. <laughs> I just have, I have a lot of kids playing sport. Uh, we were up in East Islip yesterday for my two uh, on the varsity, and then we were in Amagansett, back to Amagansett for practice, which they assisted. And then my little T-baller will be starting shortly. She's pretty cute. Um, thank you. Sorry. Sidebar. Um, Osprey are back. I noticed my first uh, couple ones this week. And what I noticed about when Osprey are back, uh, it also means spring is here. And that also means land tr landscape trucks are back. Uh, I plead with all landscapers to park not on the pavement, but on the road shoulders right now. Stay on the pavements where individuals might be biking and people might be actually using uh, uh, using it for automobile bill needs and, and pedestrian use or bike use on there. That also means that property owners should not be blocking the right-of-ways with anything uh, that would be rot from rocks to poles or such on there. Um, this is a public safety message. Uh, lastly, I was at the library yesterday for the Montauk CAC, and we have an experience here. And yes, I will put them on. These are styling here. As you know, we are all having a complete solar eclipse. That is going to be April 8th. Um, uh, the Montauk Library has these. Uh, please don't stare at the sun, obviously. I know I try to teach my kids on there. Uh, but make sure they also have the ISO on inside, which means you know they're for real. Okay, there are, uh, Montauk Library and other libraries are handing them out. Also, today is a voting day for some of the library budgets also then, too. Uh, please go uh, go vote. Uh, but I want to make sure as we look at the star, look at the sun and the moon, how it goes, make sure you protect your eyes on there. And, yes, I'll do that one more time if everyone... <laughs> Looks really good, David. Right on. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Kate? Yes, uh, thank you, Kathy. Um, the Litter Action Committee uh, met and uh, we uh, pulled their presentation today because, as uh, David mentioned, there are more and more groups are signing up for their no spring fling, fling uh, events. Um, if you have a neighborhood organization, street group, any type of group, and you'd like to participate in no spring fling, um, sponsored by the Litter Action Committee to help clean up our community. Uh, please contact Amory in my office at 631-324-2126. Uh, Ditch Plains update. We're coming to the end of the RFP period this week. If you haven't responded, uh, and that was the RFP for Coastal Engineering, uh, to uh, to to um, draw the plan for our dune restoration out in Ditch Plains. Please contact Jeannie Carroza no later than today as we are coming to the end of that RFP period. The zoning code amendment group uh, met and we are on the schedule for uh, April 16th, a work session, uh, and we will presenting a uh, first draft of a update to the gross floor area code and which will be uh, making suggestions and recommendations for what uh, new uh, um, additions to that code in terms of what is included in that code. Um, I also had a meeting with Change Hampton. They, uh, of course, will be uh, coming back to um, spruce up, uh, spring up the uh, pollinator garden. And they've also have a suggestion for a new addition for a grass meadows garden on town campus. So folks can see how easy and beneficial it is to grow grasses instead of Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and uh, I have a water, uh, I was gonna say it's Wayne Scott um, Citizens Advisory Committee meeting on Saturday, but no, it is the, uh, beginning of uh, Little League, but I have that meeting in the morning, and I just, for those folks, I wanted to let them know, and for the public, that South Fork Wind has uh, 
the town has received their uh, yearly uh, um, payment for the use of the easement uh, of $700,000 that will be split with the trustees, 60% to the town, 40% to the trustees, and they, the town has also received the first payment of the total of 500, I'm sorry, $5,500,000 that's dedicated to the Hamlet of Wainscott. So we have received that first payment that was due uh, within 90 days of commencement of commercial operation of $2,750,000. At our last Wainscott CAC meeting, and it's on the agenda uh, for this month, uh, I had asked the, that committee to start uh, compiling a list of ideas on how to um, use that money in Wayne Scott. So I look forward to collaborating on that and bringing suggestions to the town board to review. And uh, that's all I have. Great. Thank you. Ian? Uh, yeah, last week we met with the Community Housing Advisory Board. Um, I remain very impressed with that group who've been working hard on a uh, request for applications. Um, as, as everybody knows, we have the Community Housing Fund now, and so the town is going to have money to use towards housing projects, and, and the advisory board has been working on a, uh, an RFA, so people can apply for that, that money. And then they've, they've also started a section out um, two specific programs involving ADUs and first-time homeowners um, funding. So hopefully there'll be something to present in the coming weeks, um, I'm thinking in April. Um, and I look forward to, to discussion that with the rest of the board. Um, we met at, with the Spring CAC a couple of weeks ago. The, the, the topics of, of interest there are the corridor study. Uh, we actually had a meeting the very same day as it was presented before the board. So I think that group will remain involved as that progresses, um, as well as the Three Mile Harbor County project, which is obviously related, but um, you know that the county is spearheading that. Um, they also remain focused on cell service, so I was, was happy to hear that presentation today. Look forward to adopting that into the mass, into the comprehensive plan and, and moving forward with the, the wireless master plan. Um, Met also had a meeting at the Parsons Blacksmith Shop. There's a very good group of people, including a couple of local blacksmiths. Um, it's a beautiful building. I'd driven by it a lot of times, had never been inside. Uh, a great historic building. Um, there's a cleanup there on April 6th, trying to sort of sort out what types of equipment and um, and tools are original to the time period that's appropriate. Um, and there are plans to eventually have even more public um, you know, being, being open to the public more often. Um, so that cleanup's on April 6th, this Saturday. Uh, also met with the Springs Park Committee. Um, this park, uh, I think many of the members of the public are, are, it's a very well used park. I think people are familiar with it. Um, there is a uh, management plan I don't think was ever adopted. I think there is some debate as to whether, um, what type of clearing should be done, if any. There are invasive species in there. Um, and also some concerns about um, visibility if people are using it with dogs off the leash, which is one of the uses of that park. Um, a little bit of a complicated issue, but I look forward to speaking more with Scott Wilson, Natural Resources, and, and this board, uh, perhaps the coming meeting. I believe there's an adopted management plan. The management plan, well, the management plan may be adopted, but the action of actually going in to start to clear is, I guess, well, you know, it's, it's my first meeting with that group. Um, the, the committee itself was very in favor of starting to remove some invasive species. I gather that other park user, users historically have been concerned about losing shade and other yes. things. And so there's uh, the key issues seem to be invasive species, you know, for their own sake and wh whether we should get rid of those and also um, safety concerns with being able to keep track of your dogs because it is a park where people use um you know, can use it with their dogs off leash. So anyway, that's a bigger conversation. I just wanted it's to be controlled off leash, but controlled. They're supposed to be controlled. And one of the concerns with the on that committee is that because there is so much growth and much of which is our invasive species that you can't remain visual contact with your dog um, in a matter of 10 or 20 feet. And so um, again, this is part of a bigger conversation. And I gather there will be plenty of public input um, but I think it's worthy of at least further discussion um, whether we want to adopt that plan and, and start to, to do any invasive removals or not. Great. So Thanks. last night, the East Hampton CAC met. We had a presentation by Gloria Frazee. 
uh, about the East Hampton composting program, and she was looking to try to recruit some folks for the for the program for this uh, spring and summer. And I believe Tommy had said she's going to be coming on. April 16th, Correct, right, to, to do give a presentation. Yep. Uh, then there was a couple of other things that we discussed at the CAC. One was parking along Collins Avenue and the traffic issues in the business district, business district on North, North Main Street. They, were, they haven't come to a conclusion yet, but somebody had raised if those three or four spots between North Main Street and the entrance to the parking lot of IGA, if those were removed, they could, that could be a dedicated right-hand turn lane, mm. and that might make uh, ease up traffic there. Um, but uh, we had the uh, general manager from Serafina come, and so no decision was made, but that was something that the board was just, the committee was discussing. The other thing they were asking for, if you remember, we passed legislation because we had issues on North Main on the sidewalk there of bicycles and e-bikes riding, and, and um, <laughs> there was a, a safety uh, aspect that people were getting uh, basically mowed down by bikes and e-bikes. Uh, so they've asked the town now that we've passed the legislation, would we put some signage up to let folks know that they have to either uh, that they can't ride on the sidewalk. Uh, we also had some folks come to discuss the uh, proposed project, most project at the neighborhood house. Uh, they were folks from the neighborhood raising their concerns. Um, the CAC realizes that this project is the purview of the planning board, but neighbors just wanted to share their concerns and um, have a conversation with uh, the East Hampton Sag Harbor CAC. I've got a couple of resolutions on for Thursday. One is for the Kabaz purchase. We had announced last month that the town had the opportunity to purchase the front 7.3 acres of the Kabaz property at 403 Abraham's Path in Amagansett for $3.875 million, as the town had the right of first refusal in the contract when we purchased the back seven acres. Um, that purchase would be made with municipal funds, uh, and currently there are no plans for the property at this time, but I have uh, would like to sponsor two resolutions on Thursday. One is to bond for $4 million uh, for the purchase, and then we would do a resolution to acquire the parcel. Uh, I've also been had some outreach by environmental organizations and county executive Ed Romaine regarding the uh, Packaging Reduction and Recycling Infrastructure Act. That was something that that act has passed both the New York State Senate and Assembly, and they were asking for town support. Uh, I, we put together a memorializing resolution in support of the act. I can circulate that to everybody this afternoon. Uh, this is the legislation legislation mandates that manufacturers bear the responsibility for the entire life cycle of their packaging, including the costs associated with proper recycling and environmentally responsible disposal, thereby alleviating the financial burden on taxpayers and incentivizing producers to minimize packaging materials, enhancing recyclability, and mitigated the tox mitigating the toxicity of their packaging. So board members are in support. Uh, we could have that on for Thursday. Uh, then um, I had been talking to uh, Becky Hansen, our town administrator, regarding the entrance in Wayne Scott to La Companina and Home Goods after a heavy rain that flooding, and, you know, and that water can get pretty deep and that's dangerous. Folks are making lefts out of there onto 27. Um, so Becky reached out to uh, Assemblyman Thiel's office and explained the situation. Um, and he contacted the New York State Department of Transportation and uh, yesterday, we got an email from the assemblyman saying, the New York State Department of Transportation is pleased to inform you of our ongoing drainage improvement project that is scheduled to replace the existing New York State Route 27 leaching basin at 368 Montauk Highway in Wainscott. This project is anticipated to be completed by the end of 2024. So that's great news because that is that water does run deep. Um, and I worry about it freezing and, and, and whatnot. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up, and I was going to ask Rob to weigh in on this, I know many of us use Zoom 
for sometimes CAC meetings and committee meetings, but there's an issue, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but like that is going to run out this summer, correct? Right, so since COVID, uh, board members, committee members have been able to appear at meetings or the legislation that enables that is set to sunset sometime either June or July. And unless the state ex extends that uh, law, um, members will have to appear in person for the meetings. Is it all members? Because I read something, Carol actually sent something out with the housing piece that is it is if twenty five percent of members are in person, you can still zoom or no? Is that separate? I, for them to for the, the the meeting to be for them to be counted at the meeting, they have to be physically present at the board. The board, uh, the board members are the the meeting members. The the committee members. The committee members and board members. Thank you. That's so we may want to yeah i mean I, I just have an issue with that from my disability advisory group i mean transportation needs for them are very challenging on occasion so to have non-zoom available meetings to me would not make any sense for that committee um so it's something we'll have to see if there's any loopholes with regards to that because that would fall under well, it's not a loophole but well it would just fall under disability you know yeah act so mm -hmm. you know which law is it very well may be extended too. Right. And if the board, I mean, if we feel that, that, you know, we want that to continue to be able to have the yeah. ability to do our meetings via Zoom, that's the consensus of the board. I'm happy to outreach to Governor Hochul's office and uh, the, the contacts that I, I've been working with in, yeah. in Albany to let them know. Or maybe we, you know, do a memorializing resolution. We send a letter in support of that legislation. Well, so we would have to change our code also because we codified. Mm -hmm. To match what uh, the state was doing, and if there was a there was a minimum amount of members present that was needed to be able to hold a Zoom meeting in one place. So we have to look at our code again, yeah. too, Rob. Okay, so now we have some resolutions. Um, I yes, believe. resolution twenty twenty four four seventeen, a resolution to amend the corrected budget account um, for uh, resolution two zero two four three seven eight um, to the correct budget account. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. I'd like to offer resolution twenty twenty four four eighteen is authorize emergency road repair for Stewart's Lane for a dangerous sinkhole. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 419 is authorized payment to Cintas for a 2023 invoice in the amount of 192, sorry, $152. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Resolution uh, 2024 420 is accept a, a donation of a memorial bench for a gift from Kara Welling, whereas Kara Welling would like to donate a memorial bench as a gift to the town of East Hampton uh, in dedication of Peter Merritt to be placed at a marker 15M on Old Montauk Highway directly across from Lee Court. Now, therefore, be it that resolve that the town uh, town board grave, hereby gratefully accepts the donation by Kara Welling to the town of East Hampton. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. I have resolution 421, and this is to authorize conference attendance to the Long Island Natural History Conference, and be it resolved that the town board that employees Brian Frank, Morgan Slater, Tyler Borsak, William Edwards, Tina Valis Lagrena, and Jeremy, Sam's, Je Jeremy Samuelson, which I guess is the planning department, are hereby authorized to attend the 2024 Long Island Natural History Conference to be held April 12th and 13th at Brookhaven National Lab. Further resolved that the town board approves expenses for conference registration fees not to exceed $300 and mileage when appropriate to be reimbursed from the same budget account. The financial impact is $300. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Resolution 422, and this is to amend Resolution 2023-1388 uh, for a prior year's invoices, and this is to um, uh, finalize payment for Michael Devonshire, who was uh, uh, authorized to assist with the alterations of a commercial building located at 177 Main Street in Amagansett. Hereby, the resolution is hereby amended to include the correct budget account and that any invoices submitted from 2023 are authorized to be paid. Second. 
All in favor. Aye. Aye. I have resolution 423, and this is to amend another resolution uh, for payment for 2023, 1346. And this is again to authorize uh, payment for the services of Michael Devonshire, uh, who assisted in the review of Andrew's Cottage project and uh, resolve that the resolution is hereby amended to correct the budget amount code and that any further invoices submitted from 2023 are authorized to be paid. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Uh, resolution 424, and this is to retain Vincent Gordiello of the Rayner Group for Engineering Services for 2024. And this is the town requires the professional services of an engineer for the review of drainage plans and similar items submitted to the planning department review, urban renewal matters for the planning department and for the planning board and ZBA, whereas uh, Guardiello and the Rayner Group be and hereby engaged to provide engineering service on ad needed basis. Uh, and the list of payment is uh, listed in the resolution. Uh, resolved that from time to time travel from office uh, no during normal work week and travel times more than one hour beyond the work week will be charged in according with the foregoing rates. And that all subcontractors, test pit excavators, etc., engaged by the Rayner Group on behalf of the town as approved shall be billed at cost plus 10 percent and all out-of-pocket expenses incurred in connection with the services to the town except contractors as noted above will be billed at cost second all in favor aye, aye. Resolution 2024-425 is to schedule a special meeting for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024 at 1 p.m. for the purpose of an executive session to receive advice of counsel on matters related to the East Hampton Town Airport. Second. All in favor. Aye. 426 is to authorize the supervisor and the town administrator to attend uh, the express sessions uh, event is beach nourishment, the best option to protect oceanfront, which is scheduled to be held on April 4th. And the it's at a cost not to exceed $100. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. 427 is a temporary advance of funds to the capital fund. This is to transfer $1,453,000. $543 from the refuse and recycling fund to the capital fund for the uh, for the per purchase of a wood grinder. Tom brought that up in his liaison report. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 428 is an extension of written public comment period for the airport draft GEIS. The town board believes the additional opportunity for receipt of written public written public comments is appropriate. So the town board hereby extends the written public comment period on the draft GEIS until the close of business on May 3rd, 2024. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Does anyone else have anything else they'd like to bring up? I make a motion to go into executive session for CPF, personnel, and advice of counsel. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 